Good evening and welcome to tonight's Global Conversation in Literacy with Dr. James G. Some of you are frequent GCLR webinar participants and it's good to see you again. For those of you joining us for the first time, welcome. We're glad that you could be with us tonight. Your moderators for this evening are Dr. Peggy Albers, Professor of Language and Literacy at Georgia State University, and me, Chrissy Pace, Language and Literacy Doctoral Student at Georgia State University. Global Conversations in Literacy Research consists of online interactive web seminars with the intent to circulate cutting edge research in the field of literacy and language arts. GCLR currently seeks volunteers for a study on the nature of technology mediated interaction within literacy focused web seminars. You may participate in two ways. First, please consider completing a short survey at the conclusion of tonight's presentation. Second, if you are willing to participate in a brief interview, please type your email address into the chat area and a research team member will contact you within a few days to schedule an appointment. And to be interviewed, we do not have to meet face to face, we can do this electronically at your convenience. The collected data will provide important information for developing future presentations. Just so we can get an idea of those we're reaching, please take a minute to click on the box that indicates from where you're joining us this evening. Wow, we've got a lot of people joining us tonight. It looks like we have the majority of you from North or South America. We have over 250 participants this evening. We're so happy that you could be with us. And thank you for all of the university students out there that were able to join us. During tonight's web seminar, if you have any comments or questions, please type them into the chat box and Dr. G will address these at the end of his presentation. Dr. James Paul G began his career studying Latin and Greek prior to earning his PhD in linguistics from Stanford University, along with his many publications, research projects, presentations, and service to the profession. Dr. G is a member of the National Academy of Education. Some of his many research interests include video games and learning, discourse analysis, sociolinguistics, and situated learning. At present, Dr. G continues work as a Mary Lou Fulton Presidential Professor of Literacy Studies at Arizona State University. We hope that you will log on to our GCLR website to access a bibliography with links to a sampling of Dr. G's publications. And at this time, it is my honor and privilege to introduce to you Dr. James G and his presentation entitled Books and Games. Let's give him a virtual round of applause. All right. Um, let me just be sure people can hear me. Uh, it's been passively weird talking to my own computer. So uh, if the moderator would at least tell me that you can hear me, I'll go on. All right. Can, can anybody hear me? Hi, Dr. G. We can hear you fine. Okay. Well, I'm just going to assume that will stay true because I, without the audience, it's very hard to have trust anybody's listening. Um, uh, tonight I want to talk about the connection between uh, video games and books. Because I think that as we try to understand new media, uh, if we don't have what I think is a correct understanding of old media, namely literacy, we're going to make the same mistakes we currently make with books. And uh, so I want to first talk about literacy and then show what the role of digital media and games can be if we accept uh, a, a good view of literacy. Now, ironically, the view of literacy that I think is correct is very old. It's Paulo Ferreri's. 
But what's ironic, what's an irony about this is Ferrari's views on literacy are often viewed as political. Uh, and they are political. They, are, they, you know, he saw literacy and politics as inherently connected. But what few people seem to realize is Ferrari's views on reading and on literacy are also empirically true when you look at the best research in learning sciences. This is research Ferrari wouldn't have known about at the time he wrote. So in a real sense, the modern learning sciences has confirmed um, Ferrari's views, not just as political views, but as empirical statements about reading. Now, Ferrari, as I'm sure all of you know, emphasized that what he called reading the world always preceded reading the word, that is, reading texts. Uh, he also um, said that this was true, and this is a very sagacious comment, this movement from reading the word to the world and back and forth for Ferrari is present even in the, uh, as an underpinning of oral language. And I'll, I'll try to show you why that's true. Now he went further and he said it's, it's not just reading the world that precedes reading the word. It's a really form of writing the world or rewriting the world or transforming the world. Now it's pretty clear how these uh, in Ferrari's work are political comments about changing society. Uh, but they're all, they also turn out to be true of how the mind works, how learning works, and how literacy works. And that's what I want to turn to now. Uh, not uh, Ferrari's politics, but Ferrari as a learning scientist. All right, now to start this argument, let me point out that uh, to be successful in school and at school-based literacy is a form of language acquisition. Right? People in school, if they're going to be successful across time, are acquiring what we can call academic registers of language or specialist registers of language or what I've called specialist social languages. You can call these specialist varieties of language. It doesn't matter what we call them. But it's clear that a sentence like number one, cornworms sure vary a lot in how well they grow, is in vernacular English. It's the sort of thing we would associate with everyday life. But a sentence like number two, hornworm growth exhibits a significant amount of variation, is a style of language or a register of language we associate with books or with school or with a specialist domain. Uh, it's academic language. And it's very clear that as school goes on, forms of language like 1B get to be more prevalent, right? That's what ends up in your textbooks. It's what ends up in your lectures. And you certainly are not going to college if you uh, can't handle language like that. Now, I don't have time to go into this, but the, the difference between these two forms of language is, is, is grammatical and, it, and it's discourse specific such that a sentence like hornworm growth sure exhibits a significant amount of variation uh, is unpragmatic. It doesn't sound right because you have mixed the effective marker sure with the specialist variety, and there are various reasons why uh, you're, you can't do that. All right. Now, why am I going over this uh, business about the register of uh, language? Uh, it is because um, the, uh, of a result that we've known now for quite a while. It's, it's, a, it's one of the most robust results in, I think, uh, educational research. And that is, if you ask what really correlates with a kid's success in school, not, not just in the first grade, but in second grade, third grade, middle school, high school, I mean, what, is, what are the features of what a child does before they go to school that actually correlates with their success later in school, and in particular with their success at mastering uh, these specialist varieties of language and reading and writing, because these specialist varieties of language often show up in reading and writing in the advanced levels of schooling. And the, the interesting thing is one of the most strong correlates of this success is a child's oral vocabulary at the age of five. And that's always surprised me uh, and, and interests me that your oral language at five uh, correlates with your school success right through middle school and high school and college. 
um, even though you can't read or write yet. Now, another variant of this, another way to put it, I actually think they're the same fact, is that what correlates very strongly with school success is the amount of language you've heard before five from an adult. Uh, they actually correlate, and they correlate in this sense that when we say that a child's oral vocabulary at five uh, is very predictive of their success in school, we're not talking about the fact that some child somewhere doesn't know uh, the meaning of the word cookie. Uh, all children have very robust vocabularies by five. What we know is going on there is we're talking about how many words that are book like words that the child knows, how many book-like words, the words that are going to show up in books or show up in school, show up in academic registers, how many of those words has the child heard in their home environment from the adults around them? Um, now, to show you what I mean, uh, if you look at the slide that's on here from uh, uh, the Island of Expertise uh, work from uh, Crowley, you see a very typical thing. This is a mother talking to her three-year-old child. They have a plastic dinosaur and a little card that talks about the dinosaur and uh, a little fake plastic egg that's supposed to go to the dinosaur. And this is, this is what Crowley showed is pretty much an everyday occurrence in certain homes where if a child develops, even at three, a kind of island of expertise, they become a little expert, then the parents begin to talk to them, not just in the vernacular, but they begin to, be, begin to give them early lessons in school-based language. So if you say, you look, the mother says to her three-year-old, and that's from the Cretaceous period. That was a really, really long time ago. Well, Cretaceous period is not vernacular. That's not a word you expect a three-year-old to know. Notice the mother is defining the word in the vernacular really, really long time ago, uh, defining the word Cretaceous, which is a school-based word, an academic word. And then she says, and this is the hind claw, and asks them what's the hind claw. Does wait time just like a teacher, and then set, defines it for him, a claw from the back leg from a velociraptor. Notice here, she uses academic language, hind claw, and defines it in academic language. So this is, this is informal language teaching, and the parent is preparing the child for what are going to be the progressive specialist language demands of schooling. And notice she's doing this only in a domain where the child has been given a lot of experience where they can, he's played with dinosaurs, he's watched dinosaur videos, he's went to museums. Um, that, you know, Crowley showed that in, in areas where the child does not have a lot of experience, the parent does baby talk. But in areas where they've made the child a little expert, they begin this language teaching. And what we see here is the way parents prepare their child for the language demands of school. This is not just language teaching. It's also sort of preparing them for the identity of schooling, where we will accept that this type of language, which is separate from the vernacular, is important and uh, uh, something to have allegiance to. But notice that the parent realizes that in being a language teacher, which is really teaching this language of literacy, that is the language of how literate schooling talks and how it will write and read, the parent knows you don't do it unless you've already given the kid experience, images and actions about dinosaurs. The parent realizes that before you do this language teaching, you teach the child how to do what Ferrari called read the world. The kid has known how to look at dinosaur stuff and how to take in images about dinosaurs and how to interact over dinosaurs and how to care about dinosaurs. And now we get the languages. We do just what Ferrari said. We go from reading the world to reading the word. And as Ferrari pointed out, this is equally true for oral language when we're trying to get new registers as it is for uh, written language. So uh, one of the things that causes the gap between rich and poor kids is that richer kids are getting 
this sort of Ferrarian language preparation, that is, they're getting deep experiences in reading the world, in this case dinosaurs, but it can be anything, by the way. Um, parents just need some area where the kid has a lot of experience so they can begin these language lessons. Um, and the rich kids get this, but the poor kids often don't, right? They don't get the copious talk from the parents, but they also don't get the copious experience about trains or dinosaurs or castles or whatever area you're going to start reading the world in. Now, um, this is uh, you know something that it causes what we know as the fourth grade slump because kids who are learning to read in school but have not had this foundation in reading the world and experience uh, in activity before they have had talk uh, with adults uh, in this school-based register, um, those kids are at a real disadvantage, right? They have it. They're starting with reading the word without having reading the world, without having lessons in reading the world or having experiences in the world. While the richer kids have had the arc from reading the world to reading the word. Um, so they're really having two different things. Now, uh, as you can see, I view all of schooling as language acquisition, right? The acquisition of different varieties of language that are going to be used in different content domains. Uh, and I'm pointing out to you that kids are doing it very differently. Some kids have had a foundation at home based on reading the world and then reading the word, and some kids have not. And so they are just reading the word, and it doesn't work. Uh, now, uh, now I'm going to move to popular culture and digital media because it, what's interesting is popular culture today, uh, many companies in order to make money sell language. They sell language that's just as complicated as uh, the language of school. The example I've often used, but there's many, many others, is Yu-Gi-Oh cards. There's 10,000 of them, 10,000 Yu-Gi-Oh cards. Um, every Yu-Gi-Oh card uh, has written on it language that is at least at a 10th or 12th grade level. Uh, adults can't play the game, the print's too small, but uh, kids can play it. And when they play this game, and this is a card I took from a 7-year-old, um, when they play this game, they uh, uh, read things like this. Now, and I don't know what this means, by the way, uh, but my, that's my whole point. Is this is this, this for a seven-year-old child? This is more technical. It is less vernacular than anything that kid's going to see in school. This is school-based language. Uh, in fact, it's the worst sort of technical language because it uses a lot of everyday words that don't have their everyday meaning, but that are technical terms. And yet, seven-year-olds have thousands of these cards. They have to they have to play with forty at a time. They have to understand what it says in order to play the game. Listen to this. When this card is normal summoned, flip summoned, or special summoned successfully, select and activate one of the following effects. Select one equipped equip spell card and destroy it. Select one equipped equip spell card and equip it to this card. See, it, it, isn't it interesting that at school for seven-year-olds, especially if they're struggling, we give them decodable text. And the Yu-Gi-Oh company that wants to make money and does make money gives them language that most adults can't understand. Now, if you're going to make money selling this sort of language to kids, you better be a good language teacher, right? And the interesting thing is the Yu-Gi-Oh company doesn't teach this language in the way schools try to teach language. It's connected, the language is connected to a game, right? Uh, it is, uh, let me go back. Uh, it is connected to, a, this by the way is text from a website, so if you argue over what the card means, you can go to a website and get language that's sort of post-PhD level. Um, but the Yu-Gi-Oh, why the language of Yu-Gi-Oh works, even though it's technical, and how kids can learn it, is every piece of that language is tied to an activity in the game, that is to a physical move you make in the game, or to an interaction you have in the game. Furthermore, Yu-Gi-Oh! puts out books and movies and television shows that narratively enact the rules of the game, that show it in images and show it in stories and show it in actions. So what the Yu-Gi-Oh! company does is it says, look, in multiple ways, through multiple modalities, 
we are going to uh, associate each word in this Yu-Gi-Oh card with an action or an image or a story or some social interaction you're going to have. So it's marrying words, words which you've seen are as technical as anything they'll see in school, to experience, to the world, to reading the world, to actions, images, and dialogue, and therefore it works. What wouldn't work is to say to the child, if you don't understand the language, I'll give you another text, or I'll give you definitions, I'll give you words. Yu-Gi-Oh doesn't give words for words. It gives, uh, uh, for words, it gives actions, images, moves in the game. That is, it gives stuff in the world. And it marries the world and the game language. And what they have shown, and what I think, you know, this is one of many such things in popular culture, they've shown that when you immerse the kid in experience and you marry each world to actions and images and experiences and dialogue and goals, then acquiring language, no matter how technical, is easy. And when you just give words for words, text for text, definitions for words, you don't marry them to the world, then you make it very difficult unless the person has gotten the experience some other place. Now, um, this, uh, the, the, the Yu-Gi-Oh theory of acquiring technical language is the one that is supported, in my view, by the learning sciences. But the theory that we seem to have in school, especially for poor kids, that if you don't understand something, I'll just give you another text. Maybe it'll have simpler words. Maybe it'll be definitions. But all we ever trade is words for words, text for text to those kids. Uh, it's pretty clear that would put Yu-Gi-Oh out of business. Um, uh, and it's pretty clear that for the richer kids in school, they're often trading on the experiences and activities they've had at home. So uh, the paradox is uh, when children face the demands of academic language in school, it seems like it's very difficult, and some kids just can't hack it. But in fact, it isn't hard for children to acquire complex language. They do it all the time out of school. And that's because the people selling them the stuff out of school have a better theory of language acquisition and a better theory of learning. Now, you can see this. Uh, I, uh, I call this theory that we go from the world to words, that we marry words to images, actions, activities, stories, goals, dialogue, not just to other words and text. I call this situated meaning, but it's exactly what Freire called reading the world. Right, it's just in my term, just as a more uh, academic term. And uh, you can see this effect. I saw this effect very clearly when I started to play video games. Uh, because when I played my first game, I did what every baby boomer would do, uh, which turns out to be a really stupid thing to do. I read the game manual. By the way, games don't even come with manuals anymore. And uh, in this slide about your internal nanoprocessors is, is, is something I've kept from my first video game because I remember the experience of picking up this little book. It was only 20 small pages, but it had 199 bolded headings, all of them cross-referenced to each other with stuff like this in it. It was deadly boring. I couldn't make heads or tails of it. Uh, I found this passage in particular just totally unlucid. I didn't know how am I going to recognize this? What does it really mean? And all my life I had been used to thinking that if I can read something and understand it, then everything will be okay. But if I can read something and I can't understand it, it must mean I'm stupid or I won't be able to do it. I never dawned on me there, uh, that, you know, despite having read Ferrari, that it was stupid to read first and not be in the world first. And uh, what I experienced was I played the game very badly for hours. And then I came back to this book and the language was absolutely lucid. It was as clear as it could be. Because now I had an action or an image or an experience or dialogue uh, or goals or even frustration to associate with each word. And it, all of a sudden this language didn't seem boring and it didn't seem technical at all. It seemed simply useful. I could use it if I needed it. Now, my argument to you is that, that I, so, so the, my way of saying that is I had given that text situated meaning. Uh, I had not given it just verbal meanings, that is, definitions or other words. 
Now, the argument is an, exactly the same for school textbooks or any school language. Here, you see on here now something from a geology science book. And this too, this is as bad as Yu-Gi-Oh! or the game manual. This is typical academic language. It's not the stuff anybody takes to the beach to read. Um, and yet, the argument would be is if I just give this to you and define the words and give you other text to explain the words, you will be as bored and, and, uh, as I was reading the game manual. And you'll understand as little of it. You might be able to pass the test by memorizing stuff, but you, you won't be able to do anything. On the other hand, if I have immersed you in the images and actions and activities which this language is about, that as I put you in the world this language is about, which is the world of geologists and their activities and their practices and their values, if I do that, then my argument to you is this language is as easy as Yu-Gi-Oh, as easy as the game manual when you played the game, it isn't. In other words, language is complex only when it has been detached from the world to which it is about. Um, and this language can be made lucid that way. Now, of course, we can create a lot of frustration if we give only some people uh, an entree to the activity of geologists, to the images and worlds this is about, and we don't give it to other people, and, 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 and pretend they were on an equal playing field. And I will go further and say that if you have situated meanings for a text, if you've done the Fourierian act of reading the world first, uh, then, in fact, you can't fail a reading test on the passage. The only way you can get a bell curve in reading is to give some people situated meanings and other people only verbal meanings. All right. Now, this is one of the beauty of games. This is one of the great promises of not just games but digital media. Because what we're really saying is that be, to be literate, and by literate I mean to be uh, to understand the oral language and the written language of specialist registers uh, that are connected with groups of people in the world trying to do effective activities, and uh, to give situated meanings, of, we want people in the world. We want them having experiences and images and actions and dialogue. However, video games allow a tremendous extension and expansion of experience because they allow us to experience stuff that otherwise would be unsafe or impossible or not accessible to everybody. Let me give you one example. Many of you have probably played Portal. Portal is a game, very, there's two of them now, very, very wonderful game, where uh, you play with the physics of a world. You have a portal gun that will make a blue portal or an orange portal. And if you go in one, you come out the other. And you've got to manipulate the, your environment to get in and out of spaces uh, by just thinking about the physics of these portals. You have to realize, for example, that the portals obey the law of conservation of momentum. That the, however, whatever your momentum going in one is, your momentum coming out will be the same. And then you have to use that to judge how far you can go and how you can go uh, across large spaces. And you have to figure out the physics of the world. This, by the way, is an entertainment game. It's, it's, it's marvelously fun. I just made it sound like it's a game about physics, but it really isn't. It's a game about playing with physics. Now, what's interesting in a game like this is it's not teaching you the any physics language. It's not teaching you how to read physics or talk physics. But what I would argue is it is giving you the situated meanings, some of the situated meanings, that the language of physics is about, or it is letting you read the world in various terms uh, in a way that will prepare you to be a learner in physics. And one of the, my pieces of evidence for this is you get this very interesting phenomena. When players love a game like this, they want to articulate their knowledge. They start websites, or they go into what I've called affinity spaces. And they articulate this knowledge. And then they go back to the game and sometimes modify the game or talk about strategies in the game or use strategies in the game based on the knowledge they've gotten from articulating the physics in the game. So to give you an example, here is uh, a wiki players have made that is explicating all the physics in the game and linking to actual sites where real physics is done. Now, see, what I'm, my argument is the game 
is in part the meanings of this text. It is the situated meanings of the text. It's the world Ferreri told us to read before we read this text. And in total Ferrarian terms, once you can read the text, the word, you can go back and see the world in a new way. Then you can see the text in a new way. Even up to the point that you can rewrite the world, quite literally, because you can modify the game. You can change levels in the game. You can do stuff in the game. Now, um, this text, is, is, uh, it's, it, it, the game didn't teach you this language. It motivated you to learn it because when you go to it, you brought situated meanings. Right now, it intrigues me is here we have the learning in the game world going from the game, the immersion in the game virtual world to articulated language that we're not just te you know learning from a book, but that we're actually learning to articulate in a very Ferrarian way. We're reading the world first. We're getting language second. Uh, we're reading the word second, but then we're reading the word in order to go back and rewrite worlds of experience and get better in the world. It's a very Ferrarian turn, uh, although these game designers probably didn't read uh, Ferrari. All right. Um, now, one of the things about Portal that captures, you know, further what I'm saying, uh, and I've I've loved this. I've used this a lot. That this you know, for the first Portal, that what you have on the screen now is was a piece of advertising for the game. It says the game is designed to change the way players approach manipulate and surmise the possibilities in a given environment. You know, what this is saying is we're going to give you a new tool, a tool you've never seen, a portal gun. No one has ever had one. And when we give it to you, you're going to see the world in a whole new way. You're going to surmise new possibilities for solving problems in your environment because we gave you a tool that lets you see the environment in a new way. I think this is, this, for the 21st century, this should be the mission statement of education. That learning is about giving people new tools to surmise new possibilities for solving problems in their environment. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a weird world in which the mission statement on the advertising of a box is better than the mission statement in many of our schools. Right? And this truly captures the connection between words, the world, and tools in a really Ferrarian way and in a 21st century uh, way. Now, um, if, so if you were to see school as um, in terms of situated meanings, we would have to give the sorts of deep images and activities and practices that Portal gives in all different ways, not just through games. Then we'd have to give text, be sure it has situated meanings, and then go back to letting the child through writing or through activities rewrite the world, transform it, change it, not just read it. And what you would, when you do that, you would face the same problem a game designer faces. A kid is going to ask you, why should I play this game? What game is this language connected to? And is this game well designed? Is it fair and deep? Now, in fact, children are asking this in school of what we do already. Why should I do this? What is, what's connected to this? And is it going to be fair and deep? And they're getting the answer no over and over again. And they're getting the answer yes from their popular culture learning, uh, which I think is a, one of the core parts of why children are disengaged from school. All right, so what I've tried to say is to give you a learning science perspective that says that we have to understand traditional literacy in terms of situated meanings of reading the world, then reading the word, then rewriting the world. And that games and digital media not only are good for helping us in the task, they're based on this idea, right? As they're as they're operating out in the world, they are they have fan bases that constantly want to articulate about them in complicated language, so that they can go from the world to language back to rewriting the world. So, what about Ferrari's politics? I want to end on this. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I've left out that he was a revolutionary. And uh, but because I've wanted to stress to you that what, what he uh, wanted to uh, espouse as a theory of literacy that was critical and political is in fact also empirical. But, you know, today, and you all know this, we face greater inequality uh, in the United States and in many other countries than we have faced for a long, long time, sometimes forever. 
And we know from a vast body of research in mental health and in public health, research that is not often read in education, that the more inequality there is in a society, the greater the crime, the obesity, the, the poorer the schools, uh, the higher the anxiety, and the lower the health and well-being of that society. So it's extremely expensive to have inequality because it raises a tremendous health and crime problems and schooling problems. Uh, but it's also very bad for everybody. In fact, I won't belabor this, but there's good literature showing that even the rich in a highly unequal society are less healthy and have less well-being than the well-off in a society with more equality. Now, what is the, 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 what the reason inequality seems to be so bad for people's health and well-being is it makes people in the society not trust each other, and it makes lots of people in the society feel they don't count, that what they do won't matter, that they're really not participating or can participate in the society as an agent. And what you can say is that literacy and schooling cannot solve this problem alone, right? But literacy of schooling cannot be effective in a society with high inequality. So anybody who's a literacy educator has to say, I also have to be completely committed to the goal of bringing about more equality because I cannot bring about better schools and better literacy without directly focusing on this social problem of equality. And that's just another way to make Ferrari's point that the politics of literacy and the cognition of literacy and the learning of literacy are married completely. Okay, that's the end of what I have to say, and however questions are going to work, we can go to questions. I can't hear any, if somebody's talking to me, I can't hear you. Dr. G, thank you for your insightful and engaging presentation. Everyone, please join me in extending a virtual round of applause to Dr. James Paul G. Dr. G, you certainly offered an intriguing and forward-thinking perspective on books and gaming. You've offered much to consider in the realm of literacy education, and we thank you for this. Um, and as a reminder, you may access a number of Dr. G's publications by visiting the GCLR website. Let's give him another virtual round of applause. And Dr. Albers will direct the Q&A for us at this time. Thanks very much, Dr. G. That certainly was informative. And your talk really did elicit a large number of questions. So we're just going to start with a couple that have to deal with uh, children who are economically disadvantaged. And two of our listeners, audience members, were wondering how can preschool and daycare teachers uh, talk about reading the world for lower socioeconomic students they're preparing for school. They were wondering about different resources and are there any kinds of ideas that you might suggest for working with kids who might be socially disadvantaged? Okay, uh, that's a great question. You know, unfortunately, for preschool stuff for poor kids, we tend to now want to push them right to reading the word, right, to literacy activities. But, of course, the theory I'm espousing says that the problem is they're not getting the reading of the world, the immersion in experience. Uh, and that you can't short circuit that. You can't ignore that fact. So good preschool for poor kids should be extremely rich in the sorts of experience middle class kids are getting, including developing these islands of expertise. And that means exposing them to all sorts of stuff in the world. And, but you know, the most crucial variable for these preschool kids is hearing copious talk from adults about the world and interacting with adults over the world. The reason copious talk with an adult is good for children, probably the most important variable for preschool kids, is that when an adult is talking at length to a child, not just playing 20 questions or ordering the child around, 
they have to begin to talk about experience in the world and not just the here and now, but also how to relate the here and now to the past and the future or to goals and activities. So the combination of a, a rich immersion and all sorts of activities, certainly using digital media to extend the images and stuff, but always um, completely connected to loads of interactive, sustained talk uh, with an adult. Uh, and, and the more that can be one-on-one, -on -one, the better. Dr. G, one of our listeners has asked, um, how do you perhaps engage students, especially high school students who have disengaged from school? In her words, she says, checked out of schooling, especially with your ideas on games and, gamer and gaming. Well, you know, I would say the problem with the fourth grade slump and with disengaged students is the best and easiest way to solve the problem is don't do it. Uh, once you created uh, by past fourth grade, students are highly unmotivated for what uh, the language demands of school and the content demands. It's an enormously difficult problem to overcome by continuing to do schooling as usual, right? Because that's the very thing they become allergic to. Um, it's, it's extremely important no matter what age the person is, if you're going to rehabilitate their lack of trust in literacy, is to give them literacy work, reading the world, based in some area where they really have rich meanings from the world. You know, Constance Steinkohler, one of my students at Wisconsin was on the faculty there, and now also working as a, a games person in the White House Office of Technology, um, did an interesting study with Kathy Compton Lilly in which she showed that teenage boys who were very disinfected, disaffected with school, teenage boys who um, couldn't read at a fifth grade level in their school tests, in, in reading technical language from World of Warcraft, a game they played and loved and were in a guild that Constance was running for them, they could read uh, at a much higher level. They could read many, they could read grade levels above their grade level when they read about World of Warcraft. Why? Well, because they had spent hours immersed in the world of World of Warcraft. So there's no short-circuiting this. And the real problem is if we keep making time the measure of schooling. You know, what do we do in school? We pretend that everybody started at the same point. And everybody gets judged, uh, you know, at how much progress they made in a year or, two, or you know, two years or a grade or a semester. But people did not start at the same place. Some people started at fifth grade, and they're in first grade. Some started somewhere else. Now, digital media and customized education are bringing us the capacity to not have time be the measure of education, but have results be the measure. Right? What, is, what does it matter whether you learned algebra in six weeks and I learned it in six months if we both end up being good at algebra? especially if I had no background in algebra when I started, and you already did. But uh, so I'm, I'm, I know this is a depressing comment, but we can't solve the problem by keeping schools as we have them. We must go to another model that honors experience, that honors the fact that people are really smart when they have experience, and that gets rid of time uh, and uh, units and stuff as the measure of intelligence and progress. Next question really has to do with classroom resources and under how do we get teachers to buy into this notion of video gaming as a rich resource for children to read the world? Oh, and well, teachers don't need to uh, buy into just video games. They need to buy into situated meanings. That is, they need to uh, get the idea that we go from the world to words and words back to writing the world. And we want to use every modality to do that. We want to use video. We want to use social media. We want to use uh, the interaction. And we want to use games. Uh, the other thing is teachers have to uh, give up the idea that in order to use a tool like games or other digital media, they have to be particularly good at it. Uh, that's a, a nonsense view. Uh, it, it, you want children mentoring each other. You want them teaching each other. You want them um, teaching the teacher. So in a thing like games where it might be the case that the kid can teach some aspects of it 
better than the teacher. This is a winning situation because there is nothing better for a kid's learning than for the kid to be teaching. Teachers need to model what it means to learn. They need to model that failure is good and not bad, that you want to, you have grit that is passion and persistence, and that you want to learn strategically, and that you want to move from the world to the world and the word and back. They need to model what good learning is. They don't need to be experts. They need to be able to teach kids how to be in a community of experts. You know, um, any good video game is connected to an affinity space, an interest-driven community of the Internet, where people, whether they're 7 or 70, get to be real experts together by mentoring each other. Nobody says, oh, everybody has to start at the same level or everybody has to start as an expert. So our idea that the teacher is there and can't use something until they've been in service to death on it is, uh, is wrong. Okay, we have uh, another question. One of our listeners asks, is it the case then that the game environment or some similar environment can obviate the need for school, teacher, the classroom? And do you think some islands of experience, uh, expertise count more than others or are more crucial than others? Well, two questions. So uh, let me first take that there are a lot of people who think digital media, things like uh, artificial tutors, customized instruction, uh, uh, and other uh, artificial agents, other things like that are going to remove the need for teachers. And you, you can see that's very alluring to administrators and stuff who would like to save the cost of paying a teacher. Uh, but that's not, that's not what's going to happen. Uh, the role of teachers is going to change. There are going to be models of learning. They're going to resource kids with multiple tools for learning and build a, an active affinity space for learning. And they're going to design that learning. And then they're going to set up systems of mentorship where they mentor and uh, learners mentor each other. And then within that, they're going to sometimes do instruction. So they're going to be designers of learning spaces. They're crucial for that. Uh, but we don't need them to do everything in, in terms of you know, direct instruction. We need them to be, to be managers of other people's learning. Uh, it, I do not believe digital media minus a designer works at all. Uh, games that have no designers don't work. And uh, so no, we're not getting rid of teachers, but I think what we're going to do is reprofessionalize them in the role they always should have had as learning designers and not just purveyors of information. Um, the second question was, you're going to have to remind me, I forgot. What was the, what was the second? Second part of the question. <laughs> Do you think some islands of expertise count more than others? Oh, okay. Uh, so that's that, that, some. It turns out when you're talking about building an island of expertise to do the sort of thing the mother was doing with the dinosaurs, uh, it doesn't actually really matter because what you're really trying to do there is just get the kid enough experience that you can up the ante in language and begin to get some commitment to specialized languages and non-vernacular languages form this identity. So when the kid goes to school, he says, people like us, uh, don't see this as technical or complex or hard or bad or for nerds, and we see it as something good. Um, but obviously, there's an interesting question as kids and uh, you know go right because and adults too, as we choose in life to pick up more islands of expertise so that we can read you know more complex language and do more complex rewriting of the world. There's a really interesting thing about what are good choices, because often. The choice that might be good for a grade in school might not be good for 21st century learning. Right? There's a real debate to be had. Is you know you can't learn everything. Learning takes a lot of time, so you're, you have to invest a lot of hours in it. You have to persist past failure. So it's crucial to choose to put your thousands of hours into some place that's going to be truly effective. And in the 21st century, with our schools based on a coverage model, they don't even give thousands of hours of practice. Um, this is a very difficult choice for parents and for teachers of where a kid could be putting in um, his energy. Um, 
and uh, it's something you, you have to think about what you think the shape of the 21st century is going to be uh, and where it is really effective to put in your, uh, your skills. I'm not sure us baby boomers are the best judge of it, but it's a real, it's a real dilemma. This next question actually addresses the role of parents. One of our uh, listeners asks, sometimes parents have a pseudo concept about what reading really is, so how can we help parents really understand that reading is not word calling, especially in the intermediate grades? And what recommendations can you give us to motivate parents to become more involved in learning more about literacy so that they can be our partners in their child's reading development, especially now with digital media? Yeah, that's a great question, and you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's another one where books and digital media come together because let me first answer it for digital media and then go back to books. One of the things you constantly see is parents saying, how do I know whether my kid is doing anything good when they're sitting in there playing the game? How do I know it's not harmful or a waste of time? And you always find out that they don't actually go in and look at what the kid is doing and get in a truly interactive conversation with the kid. What I always say is, if, you know, first of all, you usually can't stop kids from talking about their video games. If you go in and you talk to that kid, you say, what are the strategies? What are you doing? Why are you doing it? Who are you going to do it? Let's show me it. Let, you know, even, you know, let me see, you know, get into a real conversation with the kid. You can find out whether that child is wasting their time or whether they are thinking strategically, whether they are connecting the game to the world, whether they are connecting to other activities. So in some case, you go into that room and you find out the kid is paying for your retirement. They're just picking up tons of skills. And in other cases, they're evading the world. But you can't know unless you talk to them. Now, you know, the same thing is true of books. If you, if you don't use the book as an uh, invitation to an interactive conversation where you see whether the child can uh, relate the book to the world, relate it to other books, relate it to other activities, carry it forth into knowledge building for rewriting the world, for doing stuff, then you don't know whether the kid is wasting their time with the book or not. So the first thing the child, I mean, parents are probably not going to go read books on literacy. Uh, but what they first can be taught how to do or encouraged to do is to see that they can be learners with their kids through conversation, even if they don't understand what the kid is doing. And that the judgment of the value of an activity, book or digital media, is the extent to which the kid can move from the word or the game to the world, just as Ferrari said, especially rewriting the world rewriting interactions with other people, having viewpoints of their own, being able to ask, why is it designed this way? And the parent can not only get in that conversation, even if they don't understand the media well, they can encourage it. They can encourage meta thinking. Other than that, it's an important role for a teacher, especially for little kids, to get across to parents what literacy really is, that it's a tool for effective action in the world. It's not a tool for passing tests. Dr. G, I think we have time for really perhaps maybe one or two more questions. And I think the one that really is intriguing to many people uh, says, Many people are just starting to learn about gaming, and we know that it takes thousands and thousands of hours sometimes to learn gaming. How could college professors and teachers begin to start understanding how to integrate or use the concepts of gaming and games in their classes? Well, first of all, to be a good gamer, you have to play games. You have to take a lot of time. And just like to be a good reader, you've got to read. So it's a tragedy, but you know, if you want to understand games, you, you should play them. Just if you want to understand books, you should read them. But that isn't, that isn't, always, you know, that isn't always the main thing. Uh, what you need, you need well, anybody, any teacher who wants to start here needs to do two things. Interact with children over their games. I watch them, ask them to explain it, ask them to teach you. Right, that's one of the first things to do. The second thing is there are many communities on the Internet uh, that are uh, engaging with digital media and education, all sorts of them. Find one of them and get mentored. And just as you would if you, know, if you wanted to design clothes for the Sims, you would design a community, go enter a community that would help you get started. 
You wouldn't do it by yourself. So the first thing is don't do it by yourself and don't start by reading about it. Start by talking and watching a child or a person, even an adult who is a gamer, and getting into a community on the Internet where people at all different levels are talking about it, and then read stuff. Um, and uh, do not think that the, we're, the way to learn about this is to get a book that tells you step by step what to do in a classroom. Because I'm not advocating that you just start putting a bunch of games in your classroom. I'm advocating that you start to use games and every other tool you can have to do a prairie approach to literacy. Okay, our last question is going to be from a listener who said, last year you mentioned some game development software that was on the horizon that could offer some exciting possibilities. Could you expand on that? Yeah, now, in the course of a year, there have been many uh, other, there are lots of tools by which kids can design games. Um, uh, let me mention a couple of them. There, one, one of them is a thing called GameStar Mechanic. Just go Google GameStar Mechanic. GameStar is one word. You can play m most of the game free. It's a game that uh, uh, was designed with MacArthur money. I was part of that project by a good game company. And that is a game you play by designing games. And you don't need to know any programming. Kids love it. There's all sorts of contests in it. There's communities around. So Google GameStar Mechanic. There's also a product called Kodu, K-U-D-O, which is a little programming language, but a really intuitive programming language that is made and given away free by Microsoft. And, uh, and kids can design very good looking games uh, with that and really begin to learn programming. Um, so those are two. There are many, many others, but those are the two best ones to start with because GameStar Mechanic doesn't require any programming. And Kodu is a very intuitive you know, programming language that gets really powerful results. And Microsoft is going to add to it and even put out a game that teaches it. So um, those are two places. And then there are, there, you, you can go all the way. There are engines that are almost completely professional. Uh, you know, an eight-year-old could design a professional game if they wanted to put enough time in it. So those are two products um, that I would look at first. Okay, uh, Christy, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you now. Thank you, Dr. G, for taking time with us tonight. Let's go ahead and extend Dr. G another round of applause, please. And at this time, it is my honor and privilege to introduce to you Dr. James G and his presentation entitled Books and Games. Let's give him a virtual round of applause. All right, um, let me just be sure people can hear me. Uh, it's been passively weird talking to my own computer. So uh, if the moderator would at least tell me that you can hear me, I'll go on. All right, can, can anybody hear me? Hi, Dr. G. We can hear you fine. Okay. Well, I'm just going to assume that will stay true because I, without the audience, it's very hard to have trust anybody who's listening. Um, at, tonight, I want to talk about the connection between uh, video games and books because I think that as we try to understand new media, uh, if we don't have what I think is a correct understanding of old media, namely literacy. So happy that you could be with us. And thank you for all of the university students out there that were able to join us. During tonight's web seminar, if you have any comments or questions, please type them into the chat box, and Dr. G will address these at the end of his presentation. Dr. James Paul G. began his career studying Latin and Greek prior to earning his Ph.D. in linguistics from Stanford University, along with his many publications, research projects, presentations, and service to the profession, Dr. G. is a member of the National Academy of Education. Some of his many research interests include video games and learning, discourse analysis, sociolinguistics, and situated learning. At present, Dr. G continues work as a Mary Lou Fulton Presidential Professor of Literacy Studies at Arizona State University. We hope that you will log on to our GCLR website to access a bibliography with links to a sampling of Dr. G's publications. And
we're going to make the same mistakes we currently make with books. And uh, so I want to first talk about literacy and then show what the role of digital media and games can be if we accept uh, a, a good view of literacy. Now, ironically, the view of literacy that I think is correct is very old. It's Paolo Ferreri's. But what's, ironic, what's an irony about this is Ferreri's views on literacy are often viewed as political. Uh, and they are political. They, are, they, you know, he saw literacy and politics as inherently connected. But what few people seem to realize is Ferreri's views on reading and on literacy are also empirically true when you look at the best research in learning sciences. This is research Ferreri wouldn't have known about at the time he wrote. So in a real sense, the modern learning sciences has confirmed um, Ferreri's views, not just as political views, but as empirical statements about research. Second, if you are willing to participate in a brief interview, please type your email address into the chat area and a research team member will contact you within a few days to schedule an appointment. And to be interviewed, we do not have to meet face to face. We could do this electronically at your convenience. The collected data will provide important information for developing future presentations. Just so we can get an idea of those we're reaching, please take a minute to click on the box that indicates from where you're joining us this evening. Wow, we've got a lot of people joining us tonight. It looks like we have the majority of you from North or South America. We have over 250 participants this evening. Good evening and welcome to tonight's Global Conversation in Literacy with Dr. James G. Some of you are frequent GCLR webinar participants and it's good to see you again. For those of you joining us for the first time, welcome. We're glad that you could be with us tonight. Your moderators for this evening are Dr. Peggy Albers, Professor of Language and Literacy at Georgia State University, and me, Chrissy Pace, Language and Literacy Doctoral Student at Georgia State University. Global Conversations in Literacy Research consists of online interactive web seminars with the intent to circulate cutting-edge research in the fields of literacy and language arts. GCLR currently seeks volunteers for a study on the nature of technology-mediated interactions within literacy-focused web seminars. You may participate in two ways. First, please consider completing a short survey at the conclusion of tonight's presentation. 